Okay, cool. Um, so I don't have a, you know really a lot of slides to to go through. Uh, the the key is just to you know to give an introductory overview of machine learning. Uh, but before just getting into the specific agenda of this, given that I think on the call, um, I only know Mutlokwe and uh, not not really the rest of you, and I assume you don't know me uh, either. So I was exposed to computer vision, which is a subset of machine learning over 10 years ago, where we were working on a, an identity management system, uh, you know, using uh, the face as the, the biometric identifier. And since then, I've always had a very keen and strong interest in this particular technology. Uh, but I moved from that space and uh, was in management consulting for a few years moved from management consulting and have been in entrepreneurship, um, you know, innovation funding and machine learning research since then. I'll speak a little bit about some of the work that we do in the innovation space um, with uh, our company, Grades Match. Um, so you can see the logo there. So I'll speak to specifically one of our products. Um, so we do have other products besides this. So feel free to check out, uh, you know, the Grades Match website to, to know a lot more about what we, what we actually do. My education background is in uh, technology in totality. So I have uh, both uh, technical understanding from a mathematics and computer science point of view, as well as a business understanding from the information systems point of view. And uh, over and above that, I've studied other, other things as well. But I will sort of just jump straight ahead and firstly just introduce one of our products, um, you know, just so you, you get context to some of the work that I've been involved in over the last few years. So one of the things I'm very passionate about is helping young people to successfully transition from, uh, you know, high school into university, especially young people who don't have as many resources as many of us actually have. Uh, those that could be in townships, rural areas, and so forth, they, they tend to struggle. So the idea was to build solutions that help young people with that particular transition point. And Bridge is, uh, you know, is one of our solutions. And what it does is that it assists um, a young person to figure out which career is the right one for them. It makes suggestions uh, for where and how to actually apply and how the application itself should actually be structured. And it also takes away the engagement with the university. So, you know, you'll remember how stressful it was, uh, you know, th those years ago when applying for university, well, we used to fill in forms by hand, you know, and post them and then anxiously wait a letter back. I think the system was def are definitely better than that, but was really an anxiety inducing process. This system re removes that anxiety completely by doing it all in a single platform. Uh, we, with a lot of value that's added by the usage of machine learning in the background. How it sort of works is that a person, a learner would come and sign up on, on, on Bridge. They will enter what subjects and marks they do, what their career aspirations and institution and interest actually is. And then the machine uh, learning algorithms in the background are then able to generate a strategy for them. This is something that we call an application strategy. So we don't say just because you know you want to study law, WITS is the nearest place, apply at WITS. We don't say that. We say based on the totality of your picture, this would be the most uh, suitable approaches for you to actually uh, you know, go about applying for, for university. And we explain the reasons as well um, you know, as to why the, the, those decisions were made by the system. And hence, it's in the domain of explainable AI. So the key features that sort of empower our platform is that we have a lot of data. So you're looking at lots of career data, lots of qualification data, and lots of user generated uh, data as well. Those kind of data volumes become very difficult to manage and to make sense of, um, you know, without using uh, machine learning techniques, uh, artificial intelligence uh, techniques. In our case, we're not using this machine learning techniques to take away people from work, but we actually use them to empower our our staff who actually work with these young people directly. So this becomes an enabler and not really a replacement of them. So this just gives you a little bit of a picture and a sense of some of the work that I've done um, that relates within this uh, machine learning space. So we've been doing this for, for, a, for a couple of years and we've had a lot of success um, you know, with it, lots of challenges as well. 
uh, but do check it out, uh, bridgeapp.co.za. Uh, so if you know a young person, grade 11, grade 12, uh, let the parents know about this kind of technology because it will really help them and remove the headache uh, from them. But particularly for this talk, what I'm gonna be covering is six things. Uh, I'm gonna start with just painting a picture for why AI is needed and why it's so important. And I'll get into the specifics of the what is AI, what is ML, and I'll give you an overview of what are the hot topics right now. We'll do a little bit of a demonstration. Um, I'm still, you know, in my mind trying to figure out the best way for the for the demonstration to not make it too intimidating with code, uh, but we'll see when we get there. And then lastly, I'll just talk about some career paths for, for AI. This will be at a high level, not really at the specific, uh, you know, lower, lower levels. Now, when we think about the case for AI, this for me becomes an important starting place to, to, to start with. This is an image. Um, I can almost say with certainty, unless there's a doctor on the call, none of us, when we see this image, know what it is that we are looking at, why it's meaningful, and, and what, if it conveys any meaning at all. Uh, there's very few people in the country, in the world, that are able to understand this particular image. What this image is, is actually a mammograph. So it's an X-ray vision of a breast. Doctors would use this, particularly radiologists, to determine whether there are any cancerous cells or not within the breast. That's how they go about it. Now, you can imagine that there's a lot that's happening in the cancer uh, you know, space. Every, uh, you know, over the last five years, period, you know, we, we're looking at a growth of about 24% in cases, and we're sitting at over 200,000 cases of, of cancer as we speak right now. The most common type of cancer being breast cancer. And unfortunately, you know, one of the rules of the game in cancer is that you must catch it early. If you don't catch it early, your chances of survival reduce dramatically. Now, this is a very problematic setup and a very problematic situation for us to find ourselves in, not only in South Africa, but the world over. Now, this already in itself is a problem because we're saying there's a lot of cancer and this cancer kills people and key to it is we must find it um, actually early. This is the problem. We only have 650 uh, radiologists in the country. So this are 650 people that need to deal with over 200,000 cases. And remember, these cases are growing, and the number of radiologists is not growing at the same rate as the number of cases. This means we have this imbalance um, you know, that is taking place between um, people that can deal with cancer and the actual people that are getting cancer uh, you know, uh, over, over the, the years in, in our country and across the world. It's a very problematic setup to be in. Now, if you have done any economics at war at all, you will agree with me that there is a law of supply and demand. Whenever you have demand exceedingly out, uh, you know, outpacing supply, what happens is that costs begin to drive up. So if in this case, for example, we're saying that the demand for the radiologist is increasing by 24% every five years, yet the supply of radiologists is only increasing by 1%. There's only one rational thing that's gonna happen here. The price of radiology services will become more and more and more and more expensive. You know, especially because for you to become a radiologist, it's not a one year thing. It's actually a long uh, amount of time that's required for you to acquire the necessary skill set to be a radiologist and be able to determine whether the scans, um, you know, a person has cancer or not. So this is very expensive. So what we're seeing is that the cost to diagnose cancer as well as the cost to treat cancer is, is really on the rise. And primarily part of the drivers that contribute to this is just the demand and supply uh, dynamics are not balanced. Now, here's a question uh, that we could even think about, how could we fix this demand and supply issues, right? The, the one way is let's, let's increase supply. Let's actually get as many, uh, you know, radiologists as possible to, to, to actually join this and increase our supply pool. Unfortunately, it takes a long time. If you think about the fact that one, if, if let's say in the population that we have now, there just isn't people that are interested or skilled enough to become radiologists, it means you have at least a 20 year lead time for a person to be born and later make a career decision to become a radiologist. That's a very long time. 
And then on top of that, the person has to study six to 15 years in order to, to really be a professional and, and, and efficient in this particular space. So realistically, do we have 30 years to wait for us to actually fix the supply issues? We actually don't because people are dying today. The other option is to reduce demand, but how would we do that? We don't really have a clear and good mechanisms to actually do that unless there are cures for cancers that are actually found and that would actually assist. Even that in itself is also an expensive form of intelligence. Now, this is the word that I want you to keep in your mind. The cost of intelligence is increasing and this is sort of where it touches base with machine learning. Now, what happens in deep learning is that, uh, which is a subset of machine learning, is that what we are able to do right now is that we are able to look at thousands, millions and millions of radiology images where a professional radiologist has already looked at them and said, this is cancerous, this is not, this is this type of cancer, this as that type of cancer. And then we are able to use that data as training data for our system. So this language will make sense just, uh, you know, just now as we actually go through the rest of it. We, we are able to take that data and train a system that is able to look at a brand new radiology scan that it has never seen before for and tell you whether that scan is actually cancerous or not. It's able to do it at very high accuracies, as good as any, any radiologist right now. The difference between it and the radiologist, of course, is that it doesn't get tired. It's able to look at uh, millions, if not billions of scans uh, over a shorter period of time than what a radiologist could do. Perhaps a radiologist with his human limitations or her human limitations is only able to look at 10 scans a day and make judgment on those. And perhaps his judgment deteriorates with time. It's not really the case uh, with, uh, you know, with uh, this algorithms. They could look at uh, 10,000 images and, and still continue to perform uh, reliably and well. They're not yet perfect, but they're performing well enough for us to consider them as uh, a mechanism to make radiology, radiology intelligence cheaper. Right? Because now we don't have to wait for this algorithm to go through medical school and acquire all that knowledge um, and then come and become a radiology practitioner. We don't have to wait. We can just train it now and tomorrow it's actually live and able to do the, uh, the job. So that, that time to, to create a radiologist in quotation marks is much shorter. The other thing as well is scalability, right? If you are looking for a radiologist and you are in the middle of rural vendor, you probably have to travel many hundreds of kilometers in order to find the first radiologist that can actually assist with your case. But with this kind of techniques, you can just deploy the system um, as opposed to you know, traveling the 200 kilometers. So you can scale the radiology service beyond the 600 people and make it scalable across the entire country and to reach areas where the radiologist might not ordinarily go. Now, this does not necessarily replace the radiologist, but it allows them to focus at the more critical parts of the job. It's able to do identification of uh, whether a tumor is benign or malignant right now with a very high accuracy. Why don't we free up the radiologist from that job and allow him or her to actually focus on something else? So that's sort of what, what we are talking about. And this is very exciting uh, you know, technologies. Now, it's not just in the case of radiology where intelligence is being made cheaper. It's actually everywhere. So I've just written some select examples, but really this list could have been made much, much longer. But I've just taken one or two that are quite exciting where the intelligence is always quite expensive. Now, if you look at the ophthalmology space, this is also similar to the radiology space where we have very limited skills in the country. Now, uh, my mother recently had an eye issue. She's in rural, rural vendor. For her to see an ophthalmologist, she has to travel to Pulukwani, which is you know, several uh, kilometers away. So it requires uh, a few hours to get there. It's not cheap to get there, it's not free. So this costs time, um, this costs money. So it's very expensive for her to access that radiologist. When she gets there, 
you will find that people from Zikukune are traveling there, people from other areas of Venda, people from wherever and wherever. And there's quite a lot of people that are waiting to see that single ophthalmologist. Now, there's already technology that's being deployed in India where they've been using deep learning technologies to be able to detect uh, certain ophthalmology conditions, you know, even in some cases prior to the extensive deterioration, uh, where it now requires quite a lot of effort to reverse some of the damage. Now, that is actually making intelligence deeper. In the financial services sector, there's actually too many examples, but the one example that I really like is a, is a due diligence model uh, for, for determining whether to give someone a loan or not in China. What they are doing in China with one of the, the AI companies there is that they went through a journey of figuring out alternative uh, markers uh, to determine whether a person can reliably pay their loan or not. After lots of investment and a lot of investigation, they found things like the, at, at what percentage do you actually charge your battery to be one of the critical things that determine whether you will pay your loan reliably or not. This is something that a human being will, will, will unlikely ever think about to say that actually, as part of the loan application, make these people give us uh, you know, the, 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 the history of their battery charging behavior. How often do they charge their battery? And if you are interested, it turns out that some of us who actually wait for the battery to be 3% before we charge might not be the most reliable people when it comes to paying our loans. Uh, you know, it's, it's the other, you know, interesting people who, who charge the phone, even at 70%, 50%, uh, they seem to exhibit behaviors that are consistent with actually uh, paying back loans in, in reasonable times. But that, that shows that it's not only making the intelligence relating to due diligence cheaper, it's also enabling us to find new ways of doing due diligence, which would not actually have been possible. And in Japan, by the way, I'm just remembering this case now, they've actually found alternative ways to measure uh, unemployment rates in real time by looking at uh, GPS data of how often people go to unemployment offices. Using GPS data, they're able to actually measure unemployment rates in real time. So imagine in our case, we still need people to go and ask people and interview, Have you, are you working? I do search for a job okay, you are unemployed. Imagine how much quicker, how much cheaper we could actually enable those kind of things using technologies such as, uh, you know, the ones that I've mentioned. And perhaps in your mind, you start to think, well, the areas you're listing, Ruzani, make sense. It's images in ophthalmologies. It's some due diligence stuff, um, you know, with uh, reasonable data, data markers. Um, it, it's some um, uh, GPS data. So this is very reasonable thing. So I, I, uh, I, I think it, it makes sense that AI can do this. What about in the creative world? That's where AI is weak, right? And the answer would be yes and no. AI right now is able to create songs. So you can go to the open AI platform and you will be able to see songs where, you know, they, they take a, a historical catalogs of songs like by somebody like um, Katy Perry, and then they generate a new Katy Perry song that Katy Perry never sing, sang or wrote. Uh, based on the historical type of music that she's actually done. Uh, you know, with, with art, you know, it's able to generate new art itself. It's able to write movie scripts. Some of the movies are very freaky, by the way. I wouldn't recommend watching them. They're certainly very strange. The logic is very different. But the point is that AI is making intelligence cheap everywhere. There isn't an area that is being left untouched by AI as we speak right now. You know, uh, whether it's the administrative task or whatever, reducing costs, AI is actually touching everything and it's making intelligence much cheaper. Now, I just want to show you a quick demo of, of you know, what AI uh, looks like. So, both my screens are playing at the same time. Let me actually just, uh, I'm gonna delete one of them because I want you to see this one. So what this is doing is that, um, you know, this guy is going and opening this designer thing. What it is is not important, but he's typing in information to say that I'm looking for a particular type of app, so a description. So this app must have a navigation bar. This app must have a camera icon. 
uh, it must have things like photos in the title, um, you know, and so forth. So a really descriptive message about what this app should look like. This technology is powered by GPT-3, which um, you know I'll speak a little bit more about at the end. But it's a it's a it's a new transformer model, which is really impacting the way that language models work at the moment. So after a while of describing this app, uh, I want you to see what actually happens next. So you click design. Look at this. This was not programmed by anyone. This app was actually a consequence of just an AI being given a description of a particular app. What does that look like, right? This looks like Instagram. Right now, if you wanted somebody to build you a clone of Instagram, it would cost you a lot of money. It would cost you a lot of time. But this took just a few minutes uh, to describe to an AI model that has been trained. And this AI model is actually able with uh, reasonable accuracy to actually design uh, a, a, a reasonable uh, system. And by the way, when you actually look at the detail of this app, what you will find in the, in the background is that you're actually going to find a lot of the code as well. So it's not a superficial screen. There's actually code that's actually been generated. So you're going to find HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and so forth. Um, I just want to show you one more, one more quick demo. Um, I think I'm going to need to reshare my screen. Now this demo is one of my 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 favorite demos, uh, you know, in in this uh, speech synthesis. But the context here is that we're going to see somebody who actually had a case of ALS. He was a famous uh, sports star in America, big voice, really spoke for people, and his voice has uh, degenerated to the extent that when you listen to him talk, you have no idea what he's actually saying. And what I've done is they've built a system to actually help him with that. And I'm just going to start playing it now. It does have sound, uh, so turn up the volume on your end so that you can hear it properly. No, I, I think we can't hear anything. Is it just me or? So, so Tim Shaw was a very famous, uh, you know, sports star in America. So as you've already heard from his voice, you can hardly hear what he's actually saying. Uh, Rosanna, sorry, um, we can't hear anything. I, I'm, oh, you I'm can't sure hear I'm it. Wrong. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, it's fine. What I'll do is I'll share the link with you for for this clips. This, uh, you know, there's a series called The Age of AI, under uh, under uh, you know you the YouTube originals. So what I'll do is I'll just quickly share it with you. The specific one I want you to look at is called Healed by AI. Uh, it's extremely fascinating, um, extremely powerful, and what the technology is able to do is is really Heart, heartwarming. Um, wh when I saw it for the first time, it was a, a little bit of a of a tear jacker, as they say. Um, you know, so so do do watch it. I'm gonna try and just quickly share it now. Okay, yeah, you can share. I think you can share the link um, yeah. to the video itself. Then yeah, yeah. So I'll, cool. I'll skip for 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 now, and we'll continue, and then you can just watch it later. That entire series is worth is worth a watch. Okay. Okay. But what you know, what those two sort of uh, demonstrations show you is that one, AI is making intelligence cheap everywhere, and two, AI is changing lives. There's a huge possibility for us to use this technology to actually change, uh, you know, change lives. Now, fine, we're talking about AI, uh, and perhaps you're saying, well, what is this AI that you're talking about? Let's let's get into that now. You know, it really depends on who you ask and where they are coming from. 
So if they are coming from watching lots of uh, Terminator and, and pop culture type movies, AI is the, the thing that starts out being helpful, but then at the end, right? At the end, we all die. Uh, I mean, that's always what happens in these movies. There's never a movie where you know, you and the AI live happily ever after. It always seems like the AI always kills us. I don't know what we did to us, what we did to it, but that's the view from popular culture. Uh, that view is not really a truly representative uh, picture of what AI is and what AI actually does. There's then also a view from commerce. So in business, they don't really talk about AI as much. They'll talk about predictive analytics. Um, where predictive analytics is sort of the height of the, the analytics stack, where you start with the descriptive type analytics, uh, you know, diagnostic uh, um, and predictive and prescriptive, and the two sort of high, uh, you know, activities within that analytics uh, spectrum. So that's what they would be talking about instead of using the word AI, but some of the techniques are quite the same. But when we think about it in academia, it's really about around four quadrants. What we are saying is about systems that either think like a human, think rationally, or they act like a human or act rationally. The first one, thinking like a human, this is essentially the field of uh, cognitive sciences. So this is a very big field. The idea there is that we need to study the human brain understand how it works, understand what makes it tick in order to build systems that think like a human, okay? So there's a lot of work that's happening there. I don't know a lot about that space, uh, but there's a lot that's going on there. The other space is uh, thinking rationally. Thinking rationally ends up deducing uh, every problem into a problem of logic. Um, and then you, it's really about, uh, you know, this logic construction. So it's really a big field where you can follow a, a, a logic-based approach to artificial intelligence. So don't worry too much about this terminology for, 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 you know, for now. But there's a strong field in, in computer science where you really just deal with the logic and try to understand uh, logic and, and make sense of logic, how one thing flows from the other and, and, that, kind of, uh, and that kind of thing. And then lastly, to act like a human. Now, to act like a human is an interesting proposition. When from a human, System is actually intelligence, uh, intelligent because it's not distinguishable from. Sorry, Rosani, I think we are losing you there. Um, am I the only one? No, uh, you're not the only one. Okay, um, Rosani, I think uh, you're not you Uh, yeah, uh, I think you can continue. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. I don't know what's happening with my network. Um, yeah, so in terms of then the, the you know, acting like a human is really uh, being an, an artificial intelligence is considered intelligent if it's not distinguishable uh, from a human being, um, you know, in terms of it's, it's, it's whatever the task is that it has to do. So this would require that it's able to, to do some planning, it's able to do some reasoning, it's able to process language and respond, uh, it's able to do some machine learning in order to do pattern recognition and so forth. The last area is about acting rationally. Now acting rationally, you know, as it actually implies, it is really about acting in order to achieve a particular objective, okay? Uh, or as they would say in a lot of the machine learning books, it would be about an objective function. You want to maximize an objective function. Now, in order for you to maximize an objective function, you do need to touch on all the other three areas. And that's why in the domain of computer science, uh, when we talk about machine learning, we are often talking about acting rationally. It's often about computational rationality, where uh, elements of logic will come in 
element from the thinking rationally domain, as well as element from of acting like a human will come in, because a lot of those techniques are, are very much needed in order to maximize a particular uh, objective, as well as some elements can be borrowed in terms of how the brain works in order to develop uh, systems that actually act, um, you know, act rationally. So those three sort of just paint the, the picture and the explanation of what it is is that we are talking about when we're talking about artificial intelligence. So in, in fundamentally, we are talking about uh, computational rationality systems that are able to act rationally. That's what we are saying. Now, where, where specifically now with machine learning, these two are often conflated and confused, but machine learning is essentially a subset of uh, artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, right? Uh, since uh, before the 1950s, but really officialized around the 1950s. And a lot has happened uh, and machine learning is, you know, started to come out as a subset of that. And deep learning is the newer uh, child of, uh, you know, of machine learning. But machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and deep learning is a subset of machine learning. Now, this word learning is an interesting word. What does it mean for a system to actually learn? For Mitchell would say that a computer program is set to learn from an experience E with respect to some task, uh, some task T and performance measure P, okay? If its performance in task T as measured by P improves with experience. That's a lot of fancy words, but what those words actually just mean is that you have a, a system doing a particular, a particular task, such as sorting mail into spam or not spam. If the system actually improves at doing the task as a consequence of doing the task more and more, uh, then that system is actually learning. That system is is improving with the experience that it actually has. So fundamentally, it learns, um, you know, from data. And then maybe you're thinking there that actually, you know, how is this different from, you know, the software development and what's done there? It's really very different. The paradigm couldn't be more, more, more different. With traditional software, you have lots of people writing code to perform very specific things, right? Like if you look at the Zoom system and all of all it does, of course, it, it will have uh, you know AI AI components, uh, you know, in it. But you know, if you look at that kind of system, you have somebody who has programmed almost uh, every single part of that system, uh, what it should do, how it should behave, and, and all of that. If you click this, it's do it does that. If you do that, it's really fully determined by the human, which means that uh, its intelligence is limited by the knowledge of that software development community. Whereas in deep learning or machine learning, uh, but deep learning is a good example here, is that the software is not actually written, so we don't write the software the software is instead learned. It's actually trained to, to figure out what the software uh, should be, uh, lack, of, lack of better words. What the human beings end up doing in that particular setup is that human beings collect lots of data and that data is then used as input into a learning uh, uh, algorithm, lack of better word, a learning model. And that model uh, then spits out or rather into a learning framework and that framework will spit out a model. And that model is then used to predict, um, you know, many other things or to create software and to do this and so forth. Similar to the example where I showed you, um, you know, a, a, a system being able to generate uh, the, the Instagram code uh, without being explicitly uh, programmed for, 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 for that particular task uh, or, or the, the code for Instagram is not put into it, it spits it out. So the system itself became an output. If I put it more simply, in the traditional approach, that would be the top, uh, the top approach. In that traditional approach, what we would be doing is that we would take data uh, and algorithms and throw it into some computation and then we'll come out with answers, okay? So if you were writing any code, you need the data and the algorithms in order to get to an, uh, you know, to, to answer particular questions. If you needed to answer new questions, you would then improve your, your data and your algorithms to answer that new question and so forth and so forth. But in the machine learning paradigm, what we do is that we take the data and we take the answers and we put it into some computation, we get a model out. And then that model is able to answer many other questions uh, that we, we, we haven't even asked as yet. 
Okay, so that's sort of really a little bit of the difference between the, the two paradigms. Now, I'm just going to break down each one of these layers so that we understand what they are actually uh, about. If you look at the data, the, the data and the answers layer, you can have data that is actually labeled or data that is unlabeled. When we say data that is labeled, we mean that the, the data has uh, this clear annotations to make meaning of that data. So it's not just a picture of a cat, but it's a picture of a cat with the word cat uh, that's put there. And of a dog that's put there. Similarly, if you have data of, um, you know, pricing of houses, so you would have certain elements that determine the price of the house, such as the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, the size of the house, and then you would have a label, and that label is the price, okay? So now you can then train a system based on that information that I have, the, the, the data and the answers. Whereas with unlabeled data, you actually only have the data and you don't have the answers, which means that in machine learning, you can also just put in the data um, and not without having the answers and you're still able to do something quite interesting. So you are then able to put in this data without answers and there are various other tasks that you are able to, to achieve. You are able to categorize and classify this data into, into different sort of buckets. Now, the kind of data that you can put in is also really not limited. So you can put in data from Excel. I think in the previous sessions, you've looked at Excel data and how that's structured and what that looks like. You can put in data from Excel. Uh, you can put in time series data. Uh, you can put in um, panel data. Uh, you can really put in different kinds of data. You're not, uh, you're not limited here. You can put in IoT type data. So this will be data that is coming at extremely high volumes, sometimes in real time. Uh, you know, there are really techniques for us to handle even that with machine learning systems. And you don't even limit it to those kind of data alone. You can put in satellite image type data, satellite, uh, you know, remote sensing type data. And you can also put in text uh, data. So if you were to convert from one language to another, you would put in data from the two languages, perhaps in the trading phase. Uh, and then that system would learn to actually, um, you know, uh, translate words that you, you never actually explicitly uh, trained it on. It's able to actually generalize. So that's sort of what that data is. So you can handle both structured data and unstructured data. So structured data being the most common type of data that we find, that would be data in tables. You can organize it in your relational databases and so forth. And unstructured data, you know, being everything else. So images are unstructured, words are unstructured, uh, tweets and so forth and so forth, okay? Now, the in the computation layer, you can sort of think about three key buckets. The first one being referred to as supervised learning, then unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning. These are the general, uh, you know, sort of buckets. In supervised learning, that's where you are using data with labels. So that's the label data stack that I, that I spoke about. Here, you actually put both the answers, um, you know, as well as the data. And you, you, there's, in a sense, there's a teacher who is telling it uh, these are the examples of the correct things. And then, uh, you know, whatever else it sees is almost like the exam set up where it has not seen those questions before. The kind of things you are able to do in supervised learning are regression. This is where you would perhaps be trying to predict a continuous variable such as the price of a house or classifications. This is where you will be able to, to predict a category such as based on the data, is this uh, uh, an expensive house or a cheap house? In unsupervised learning, it's, it's a little bit different from supervised learning because you only have the data and you don't have answers. And, and you are learning, so essentially you are teaching your system to, to learn without any help. So it doesn't have any examples of what is correct or not correct. And what it ends up being able to do is that it's able to do clustering and associations as an example. So in clustering, it's able to group things, similar things together. So if you just gave it, uh, you know, a, 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 a hundred thousand rows of uh, details about houses, uh, and you didn't tell it that, you know, that the, the price is sort of the label, you just gave it that and you, you, you wanted it to classify it, it would then be able to look at all the data and make sense and make meaning and put it into buckets and perhaps say, these are the, the very expensive houses, these are the very cheap houses, and somewhere in the middle here, we have the medium priced houses, okay? 
And then the last, um, you know, sort of computation approach would be the reinforcement learning approaches. This is very much similar to how you train a, a pet uh, or an animal, uh, I guess a little bit with a, with a child as well, where you, there's, feed, there's sort of a feedback between you and the thing that's actually being trained. So when it gets it right, you say, oh, you know, great job. You did a great job. When it does something wrong, you say, hey, no, don't do that. Um, and then over time, it figures out how to maximize uh, doing right things. So you'll find this a lot in, um, you know, in games. So when you deploy an AI system into a game, often you can't, you, you don't really have lots of example data and so forth. You, it's a reinforcement learning sort of case where you would just reward it based on the correct behavior, such as, uh, you know, each not dying. I think you would lose points and, and lose blood if you look at like, you know, Tekken or, or Street Fighter type games. Uh, and then it just doesn't want to die. So then the system will learn how not to die in that game as an example. Now, when you think about this world with all these three terms, um, you know, I've sort of touched on this, so I won't spend any time here, but the point is that in the uh, unsupervised learning, your classification examples are, have a lot of use cases because you can do diagnosis of cancer, as I mentioned. It's a classification task to determine whether this, uh, you know, radiology scan is cancerous or not. In the super supervised learning regression uh, type activities, you can do forecasting. So you can forecast the stock price. What will the stock price be like in the next five years? Uh, you know, of course there, I wouldn't recommend you to make investment decisions based on that. Uh, but yeah, it, it is something that you, you can do as well. And then in the unsupervised learning side as well, uh, in the clustering, as I mentioned, you can, you can do you, you, you can do things like uh, customer segmentation where you can look at the data of all the customers that you have and then start to categorize them without lots of information about um, you know, the, the label or the target variable. And then you are able to say, well, these customers are my loyal customers. These ones are not loyal. These ones can shift either way. And that's sort of how you, you can think about these different types. Now, I like this particular uh, picture when I think about the, 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 learning, uh, the learning techniques. Uh, that are actually uh, available. Oops, the the learning techniques that are available. So I, I like to think about it in terms of there are, you know, deep neural networks um, or just neural networks as one computational approach. Uh, the statistical models, that ensemble models, the decision trees, as well as probabilistic models. This picture for me summarizes the entire domain of. Uh, techniques in the in the machine in the machine learning world, and what you do with these models is that you know you will then run them on some sort of computation such as your you know uh, your cloud computing environments, and it's important to sort of touch base on the cloud computing side of the story because it's a consequence of cloud computing as well as uh, you know the explosion of data that has enabled uh, machine learning to be as successful as it is right now. Okay, so so that sort of just gives you a sense, and I'm just going to go through an example by just taking one of this one. So specifically, neural neural networks, given that they are the most popular right now. Okay, so don't worry about some of the maths that you're going to see in the next few slides. It's not uh, critical for you to understand. It just gives you a little bit of intuition about how the systems actually actually work. Now, when you think about uh, a a a neural network, you know, what are the most basic things to remember from high school maths? Is that when you have a line like this, uh, you know that it, you you know it's really informed by some formula called y is equals to m x plus c, where your m is essentially your slope and your c is your intercept. In this particular line that I have here, the intercept is zero because it's going through you know the the origin, and your line would be defined by something like y is equals to one x plus zero. Okay. Now, what if you wanted to draw other lines? All right. What you have to play around with to get to these new lines is that you can change your m value as well as your c value uh, to get to one of these new lines. So your m is given by essentially your rise over run, right? So that's the change in y over the change in x. And then your c is just the intercept. Really basic stuff. You remember this from high school. Okay, so now when you think about sort of like a, a, a linear regression question, perhaps you have price as your x axis and size as your y axis. You could have a setup where 
you have all these data points between the size of the house and the price of a house. And you're trying to predict a new point to say what rule actually governs this so that if I have a house, which is some size, I'm able to predict what's the likely price, right? So what you could then do is say, I wanna predict this X that's here. How do I go about it? How you go about it is essentially doing what I was talking about, playing around with your M and your C in order to figure out a line Okay, so this line that is able to capture the data generally enough so that you are close enough to the right answer when you do make a guess. Okay, and the point is not really to be correct per se, but to be as accurate as, as possible. I, I think you, you're, you, you're not really, uh, you know, going to be 100%. You're going to be close enough for it to be meaningful. So in the first X, you can see the formula is just your normal y is equals to mc plus, you know mc plus c uh you know the it's the same formula that we mx plus c that we saw before except that i've written w1 and x1 okay so pretty much the same thing and because the last one is a little bit of a polynomial so you would need um sort of two w1s um you know w1 w2 and x1 and x2 now what's important now is that if you wanted to change any of these lines as i mentioned what do you have to play around with you have to play around with your w1 as well as your c your x is fixed this is your data so your x is the data that you actually get and your y is is what you're actually predicting. If you have labels, then you also have an example of what that Y looks like. And this is where you would do something like this. So you would then initialize your Y, your W and your C to some initial values. And then you do something that we call a forward pass. In that forward pass, you're just saying calculate uh, Y is equals to W1, X1 plus C, that's all. But you also calculate something that we call a loss function. A loss function or an objective function, as some might call, is just a way for you to uh, improve your system. So essentially, a simple version is to say, OK, cool, in this line that you have just put in now, how, how different is my y versus the actual one that I actually have? That difference will give you sort of an error, OK? So it's also called your error, your, your error as well. Now, if you, you will find that there's a gap, obviously, between your actual and your y, this is where you do something that you call a backward pass. Now, in your backward pass, you then use derivatives uh, to determine, um, you know, to determine what you should change your W and your C by in order to actually get the right value or the closer value of, uh, you know, of Y. You know, I hope that makes sense. So as I said in the previous picture, so in order for you to shift that line, you only have to play around with two things, the slope okay as well as the intercept the slope is effectively your derivatives all right a der the slope is the derivative derivative what is the intercept um you know is just really the the intercept uh you know the the bias term as we sometimes call it so in this maths here i have left out the b the c uh you know term for for ease of understanding now this becomes fundamental because a deep learning network works in a similar way Except that you can look at, uh, you know, a little bit of understanding of how a neuron works uh, from high school biology. A neuron would have these things called dendrites. The, the, these terms are not important, but the point is that it has some sort of way to actually get input. It has some sort of way to compute the input, the SOMA. And then it has some sort of axiom, which is sort of taking the, it's the output, get the output out and then move it to the next cells. Okay. Now, an artificial neural network is very similar to that. This is where you would have some sort of inputs, such as your room and your size, okay, to determine the price of a house. You would then apply some weight. Remember I said you only have the weight and the uh, intercept to play with. You will multiply those rooms by a weight. And then you get some sort of formula which says rooms times the weight plus size times the weight, uh, you know, is going to be how we are estimating the price of the, of the house. And then in order for you to capture nonlinearity, which is what makes uh, you know, neural networks effective, is that you would use something called an activation function. Okay, this activation function essentially controls uh, you know, your, your result quite well. So it will keep that result in a range. Um, typically that range will be between zero and one or between minus one and one based on the activation function you actually choose. So there are different activation functions uh, such as the sigmoid, uh, the ReLU and so forth. So this is not really critical to remember, but just know that 
you know, when you when you multiply this thing together and add them, you might get a result like a hundred. The activation function squeezes it to be a number between minus one and one. Okay, and then that gives you an estimated price. And then once you have an estimated price, you calculate your loss function again, and you could just use a you know the distance between the two squared, so the squared loss. So you just say what was the actual price versus this one that I've predicted. Um, you know, and then let's look at that as the difference, okay? Now, here is then the, the little bit of the tricky part with, uh, with the deep learning algorithms and how they work. This is something called uh, backpropagation. So this is where you use the chain rule and, uh, you know, derivatives in order to improve what your, your Ws are going to be so that you are closer. So what you would essentially say, but okay, what if I changed, uh, you know, the price? So this is the loss function that I got in 10. But what if I had changed the price? What would my loss function would have been? That's what the DL, DP actually mean. This is just a partial derivative. If you've not uh, really done calculus and this is a bit of a foreign, um, you know, numbers or foreign terms, this is uh, not critical. Um, you know, and similarly, if I actually change my activation function, what, what would be the impact on my price? If I if I change my rooms, what would be the impact on my activation? Uh, you know, sort of sort of function on my nonlinearity there. That's sort of what you are doing, and then you do this iteratively, very much the same way that we did before. You would initialize your your W and your B for ease. I didn't show the B term here, but the B is that intercept term that we mentioned before. And then you would do a forward pass. The forward pass is what you saw here, where you just, uh, you know, calculate, uh, you know, the, the multiplications and the additions, and then that will give you an estimation of your P, your price. And then you calculate your loss function, and then you take some derivatives, you update your weights, and then you start again. You go back and say, now that I have new weights that I've changed based on, uh, you know, my, my partial derivatives, uh, what, what will my new, my new uh, price be now? What will you estimate it to be? And you keep doing that until you are at a, at a reasonable uh, loss, uh, you know, sort of error. So you want to minimize this error to be as small as possible. And that's why you actually take derivatives. And what you are seeing here in the backward pass, that first thing at the top there is very important to this back propagation, uh, you know, algorithms. This are essentially, this is essentially your, your chain rule from our calculus. So if you don't understand any of this and you're just like, wow, what is actually going on? Don't worry too much about it. Uh, most of the, the implementations of uh, deep learning do this for you. So you won't have to do this by hand. This just becomes important to know if you're going to be sort of, you know, participant in the space, then if you know the maths of how it actually works, then it's easy for you to know why it didn't work or why it worked, okay? So you'll be able to build it better, okay? Now, when we talk about deep learning, it's just this, but you do it multiple times. So you have, instead of just two Xs, in our case, we had price and size, you then have multiple, you have N Xs. So you can have price, size, you have bathrooms, you have garden space, pool, et cetera, et cetera. And then instead of just having one unit that is calculating that nonlinearity, what I was calling the activation function, you actually have multiple of them. And then they take their output and pass it to another layer. That layer can take its output and pass it to another layer and another layer and another layer. So when we say deep learning, we're just talking about a network where you have more than, uh, you know, more than one or let's say two plus hidden layers. So in this case, the hidden layer is that part where we were calculating the activation function. We call it hidden because you don't actually uh, program, you don't, you don't actually do anything explicit on that. It, it actually does the calculations itself. You, you, for all intensive purposes, you don't see it. If you just take a, a, an existing deep learning framework and apply and apply it, you won't even see uh, you know, those layers in terms of, like you won't touch them in quotation marks. They are hidden for all intensive purposes. They're a little bit like a black box, okay? So there are different uh, you know, types of, of this deep learning uh, models. One of them is called the convolutional uh, neural network. So I like this image because it gives you a, an, intuit an intuition about how it's actually working and what it's actually doing. So if you got an input picture, uh, an, an image of a dog, the first layer, um, you know, it will do very much the same things that I told you about. It's gonna do, uh, you know, 
it's going to multiply things together and add them together and apply activation functions. Now, what it will do in the first layer when it's trying to recognize an image is that it will actually find superficial, uh, you know, sort of uh, representation of that image. Uh, perhaps it's just going to look like really weird things that don't make sense. But as it actually goes deeper, it starts to identify meaningful things. So it might identify the edge of the animal. It might start to identify different body parts of the animal. Anymore. It might start to identify very specific detail, but then it might start to identify group things like a full leg or a full face, and then it can then get to the point where it can identify the full the full animal. That's why deep learning is powerful. So it seems that as you make this deeper, you can get uh, you know better results in terms of your your loss function. So it can be more and more minimized, and you can get a higher accuracy um, you know as well. And that's sort of the exciting part about. Uh, about deep learning. There's no free lunch. So just making it deeper does come with other consequences, which I won't talk about, but there are things, um, you know, referred to as overfitting, uh, you know, and so forth that you will actually run run into if uh, if your network is actually too big as well. So you have to to balance it out. Um, so, so you don't just make it too, too deep. So there's sort of like four key different types of deep learning networks. Uh, so I won't really go into too much detail. But the, the first one, the second one that I showed that I showed you is called the fully connected one. This is where all the layers are, are connected. Um, so if you have three outputs and you have three uh, three inputs and you have three hidden layers on the first layer and three in the in the second layer, each uh, input is connected to each hidden layer. Each hidden layer is connected to each hidden layer and the next output eventually until it gets to the actual to the actual output. This is also called uh, the multi-layer perceptron. I normally call it the multi-layer perceptron. Um, I don't know why. I think I like that word better. Convolutional neural networks is the one that we just saw now with the dog. Uh, this essentially works uh, largely for, for images. So you would use it for, for image uh, related tasks. And then you have recurrent neural networks. These are fully connected neural networks, except that there's some feedback loops uh, that are built in. And this is what you would use for uh, sequential data, uh, such as speech, uh, such as time series data, and so forth. So I, I work on time series data, so I use the recurrent neural networks quite a bit. And then encoder decoder networks are just essentially uh, two, the, the, you know, in simple words, there are two neural networks that are sort of matched together. The one neural network will take the input and reduce it to a small version. And then the other neural network will take that small version and try and recreate the original image. And it tries to essentially say, how, how accurately did I create uh, the, the, you know, to the recreate the input that I actually received? So, so those are like the four key ones. And I'm just touching on deep learning, not because it's, uh, you know, it's the only one, but because it's the most popular one. And I'm sure you've heard about it and you, you, you would have wanted to hear a little bit about deep learning, okay? Now the key and the hot topics that are happening right now, there's a lot, okay? There's really a lot. I could actually just talk uh, this entire uh, discussion on just the hot topics right now. But the big ones that I'm sure you've heard of is the ethics um, you know, matter in, in AI. This is fundamentally something that you've seen that a lot of these computer vision systems uh, are not often as good at recognizing black faces and black features as they are at white faces and white features. This could just be a consequence of the input data uh, and of course, the you know the, the a lot of the data right now that they are trained on is data from the the Western world, which which makes it all the more important for us to build our own systems here, uh, so that they can represent us and and some of our differences uh, and you know and allow them to be captured quite accurately, and also training uh, you know image classification systems is is very expensive. Even language systems, in fact, deep learning is very expensive in general. So if you're going to build a system which is able to to accurate to accurately detect uh, you know something quite quite uh, quite novel or whatever that thing is, often it's very expensive to start from scratch. So you would apply something called transfer learning, where you would take a system that's already being trained on an existing data database, and then you will say it's already learned certain features there, and then you will sort of just fine tune it for your own environment. So when you do that, you are inheriting the, the biases that are already in that particular system. So you can imagine if it's a it's a it's an image classification system, but you're taking a system trained on white faces, and then you are fine tuning a little bit for it to, to pick up uh, black faces, and, and then you take it live. 
five. So those biases are already in the system because you've done transfer learning. That's the difficulty. Uh, GPT-3, I won't mention all of them, just the, the key ones that are hot, but GPT-3, you have to know about it. It's very hot. The, the demo that I showed you of the Instagram being created is built on GPT-3. This is the biggest uh, language model that we have right now. It has 145 billion parameters, which is massive. It's a lot. Um, many have estimated that it, it has cost you know, over, over $10 million to actually train. Uh, which is a lot of money. I mean, in rents, you're talking about 250 million, 300 million rand just to train a neural network. But it's very accurate, uh, you know, in what it actually does. It's it's very far from where we need to get in terms of our language models, but it moves us very, very close. And it's really begun this race where now there's a bit of speculation to say who's going to be the first company to get to a trillion, right, to a trillion uh, parameter uh, neural network. And then there's some uh, interesting ones. Which one should I mention? Uh, qu qu yeah, causality and explainability. Maybe let me touch on explainable AI, which is sort of what we do with, with Bridge. So explainable AI is very important because even after you have a very accurate system, which is able to identify whether something is a dog or a cat, you can't, you can't uh, if you ask and say, why? Why did you say this is a dog? It can't tell you why. So it is a little bit of a black box approach where you know the you you don't know why the system did what it did, and there's a lot of techniques that are being explored now to improve explainability to say that a system should be able to detect that it's a cat and then say oh yeah I think it's a cat because I saw the pointy ears I saw the fairy the fair I saw the way it worked uh, the, it walked whatever are the key features um, you know of um, you know of a, a cat and so forth. And there are many others, uh, you know, I, I can mention all of them uh, and really all of them are quite exciting. Uh, the other key thing just to mention here is that the key move right now is to deploy AI in industry. In South Africa, we're very low in our deployment and, uh, you know, it's, it's really an opportune time to really deploy a lot of systems uh, in this particular setting and space. Um, and then what I will do now is just show you a, a little bit of a quick demo uh, I, I was a little bit torn, as I mentioned, uh, about what to what to show you, uh, specifically because I didn't want to show you code, um, you know, and and scare you and scare you off, um, and, and feel like those that can't code are a little bit left out of the story. But what I'm going to show you is just like a, a quick uh, a quick demonstration of a few things that you can do with uh, you know with AI. So on the system, there's um, something called quick draw. This is done by Google. It's really a fun little thing where you can play Pictionary against a computer system. Um, so you can go and sort of, it says you should draw a steak and I don't know how to draw a steak, by the way. Uh, I don't know how to draw a steak. Okay. Um, and you know, this is really Pictionary and you can imagine how, how powerful the, this can be, you know, so so this kind of thing. So this is really an exciting sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of experiments that you can go and see with Google, where you can see AI doing this uh, little gimmicky things, but it's not just about the gimmicky things that it's doing now. It's also fundamentally about the implications of this, right? Uh, the implications is that if a system is able to recognize uh, you know, your drawings, it can actually assist in many different areas. So maybe a sketch artist needs to just give some hints and, and the AI system will actually fill out the missing play, uh, spaces in order to help in identifying who the criminal actually actually was. And then another one just worth uh, seeing is that, uh, you know, this uh, face of this lady, this lady doesn't exist anywhere on earth. This lady was created by a, a, an artificial intelligence network, uh, you know, so to this other person. So there's this uh, website said this person does not exist. These are people that are created by a system. What it does is that it, it learns um, sort of uh, features and then generates new, uh, you know, sort of um, people uh, that have never existed uh, before. This becomes very interesting uh, and important, especially in, in areas uh, such as fraud, where a company could just take a picture of this guy who doesn't exist and say, this is our managing director in Holland, right? And a lot of fraudulent companies are starting to use this kind of uh, images 
uh, you know, and so forth. But it can also lead to very powerful sort of cases and scenarios, uh, you know, as well. So it's not all doom and gloom, right? So that just gives you another sense. So there's really a lot uh, that you could actually uh, could actually do. And the other one that I want to show you quickly here is that you can then take some data about uh, you know house house prices and say, well, I have some prices uh, house data, and I'm looking at the data essentially. Um, let me just quickly add one more line here. Okay. So if you're looking for at this kind of data, you could actually, it's taking a bit of time. So as it's actually running, okay, here it is. You could say I have data about, uh, you know, about prices of houses in the VAL. I have bedrooms, I have bathrooms, I have the size, I have the floors, I have the views, the condition, the grade. I have all this information. And I also have a pr the prices of houses over the last, uh, you know, 10 years, five years. And I, I'm trying to make a decision whether I should actually buy a house or not. And this house has the following features. It has the following number of rooms, the following kind of view, a swimming pool, et cetera, et cetera. How much uh, is actually a reasonable price based on historical data? So you could actually build a system like this where you, you know, you this is just sort of visualizations where you're able to see what is the distribution between, uh, you know, the, the various features you are able to see the relationship between the price as well as various other features. Uh, and you're, you're, you're able to, to look at that and say there's a linear relationship, there isn't, and so forth. So this is what you are, you are seeing here. And I don't wanna, because uh, I think we've spent quite a bit of time, so I wanna just rush through this. So this is where you start doing the modeling. So this is where you can just import you know, easy things such as a linear regression model. And you are able to say, well, what I want to, my label, is my price. So this is the target variable. And then the rest of the things are actually the, you know, the, the predictor. So these are my X, my X values. You, what you often and always have to do with machine learning is that you have to split your data into data that you use for training, as well as data that you use for evaluation and data that you use for testing. But often people would split it into two, just training and test. I think this is a bit wrong because you will end up overfitting. So it's better to have three. And then the test, you make sure that your system never sees that data uh, except at the final moment. Uh, and then you can use your evaluation to improve the performance of your, of your system. Once you've split uh, you know, the data, it's really as easy with this um, you know, SK, SK learn to just say you know, that linear regression I've defined fit this data where it's my training data uh, that I'm, being, I'm fitting. And then how accurate did you get, uh, you know, with that particular training? And it can tell you that I got to 73%. This tells you that when you are then looking at a new house that you've never seen the price of, you can be certain, uh, you know, with 73% accuracy that, uh, you know, this is what the price should actually be for that particular, uh, for that particular house. So the rest of it is just a really different, uh, you know, sort of improvement. Um, in models that one could actually, you know, look at. This is a common example that is used in the in the machine uh, learning space, but it's it's really um, it's one that uh, I, I had I created a South African version, but it wasn't as accurate. Let me see. It's actually on. Okay, uh, it's it's not as accurate as the one with American data, just because the the data is not uh, you know available. So okay, this is session started. Okay. Once this session gets up and running, I'll show I'll show it to you using Joburg data what the house prices could actually look like. But the point is, you could actually take uh, you know this kind of model and run it with the house data in where you stay to determine uh, if I want to buy a house with this kind of square feet. Or what is the system saying the price should be around? Uh, you know, with what level of accuracy, which becomes very helpful uh, as a decision assisting tool. And then I just want to show you uh, this as well. So this is just a, a system called K K9, and I've just taken some of the um, uh, you know examples that they have in the system. Now imagine that you were given um, you know calls uh, calls data. If you open this calls data, so you will see it's really calls data. This is uh, such as um, uh, this features that you have is uh, night uh, night minutes. Uh, uh, 
customer service calls, day calls, and so forth and so forth, night calls. This is really call data. So you're given a bunch of data about customers, and they say that these customers have made the following calls at the following different times. And then you're also given information about their contract, right? And they say, well, their contract um, is that some of them have an international plan. Uh, some of them have a voicemail plan. This is the state they stay in. This is their area code. This is their phone number, right? This is the data that you're given. And then you're asked to say group, uh, you know, these customers into segments together so that we can perhaps uh, offer them upgrades together and not really shoot all of them, which is what they do, right? You, you, you might have just renewed your cell phone contract yesterday and then you get a, a call from a cell phone company saying, oh yeah, we wanna give you a cell phone contract. It doesn't make sense. So this then says, this is how you could target different people because this is the categories that they belong to. So what you would do is that you would use one of the, an algorithm here called K-means and K-means is a, it's an unsupervised learning approach. So if you remember from the supervised learning discussion that we had earlier, and what it will do is that it can give you a little bit of a cluster, clusters to say, well, you have a cluster of people based on the following attributes. And it has taken that and it is able to create 10 clusters to say this is where uh, the grouping that these people actually fit into, which is like very exciting and very hard to do without machine learning, all right? It would require a lot of coding in order to not even get uh, a result as good uh, you know, as, as, as this. So that gives you a sense of what you could do with some sort of a customer segmentation model. Um, I can't remember if I ran this one or not. This you could also using the, the same data is try to determine a customer, customer churn, which will be important for your, you know, for your, um, for your for your strategy around um did i execute this okay this is giving me a bit of an error okay so this would be important for your strategy uh, uh around your services that you actually offer your customers so you could use something like this and at the end of the day having run it on similar data you've trained it to determine the likelihood of churn and you're getting some good accuracy this is like 92 percent accuracy and you're getting something here called a confusion matrix so uh, you know it, it's not really important but those two rows just tell you um you know where, where when uh how often i got the right thing right and then the other ones tell you how often I got the right thing wrong. So something along those lines. It's not really critical to, to know uh, for, for, for this particular purposes, but this just gives you a sense of some of the case studies that you could do. So I wanted to show you this as, a, you know, as an example without any code being applied. And with this, you are able to do you know, something that's quite exciting. Um, you know, and and quite uh, you know, and quite interesting to to actually to actually look look at as well. Um, I want to just see if um, you can actually see here the decision used to determine the churn rate. So remember, I mentioned decision trees as one of the you know the areas. So what you will have is sort of a categories, which is the churn. That's this is sort of what you are your target variable, your label. It will say day charge. If day charge is less than this number or greater than this number, this is sort of the flow uh, that the uh, you know a person goes through. And then you can see if the voicemail plan num detail is less than this, uh, this is what it looks like. Then you go from voicemail. If the evening charge looks like this, this is what it looks like. If the from evening night charge, and so forth. So this is then creating a for you a model where now you can um, intervene. Uh, in order to change the churn output of your customers. So you can say, I can see what is going to impact the churn rate. So in order to actually change, um, you know, this particular uh, trajectory, these are the following levers uh, that I can actually look at. These are the following interventions that I can have in place. So this gives you a nice explanation um, of what is actually going on. Okay, so those are like brief, uh, you know, examples but um, you know, that just gives you a, a little bit of a sense um, of, 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 of what you can do with some of this machine learning stuff. I was going to show you a little bit of my work um, that I do, but I decided not to, uh, just because when I was really working on the, on the, just trying to think about how to explain some of the maths behind it, um, I just thought it might really eliminate some people who might not be as strong in, in maths. So I left that part out. 
But I think that demo, although very brief, just gives you a sense of what you can do. If we have more time, I, we can look at it a little bit closer. Uh, but I was just giving you a sense. Uh, I'm just sensitive with um, with time a little bit as well. Okay, and then in terms of the career paths, this I I I, I saw in a data camp talk, um, and I I really liked it. I, I thought this is a nice summary of the archetypes. So these are not really career paths; they're just archetypes of uh, of different uh, you know sort of jobs that are available in the data science uh, world. So the one thing is that it's a data consumer. This is just somebody who. Um, you know, we'll be using basic uh, tools, uh, but primarily they are receiving data. So they would get the output of that clustering al algorithm to say, this is sort of your customer uh, segments for this customer class. This is what we, you need to focus on. Send the social media campaign, uh, you know, as an example. And then a data analyst is, is somebody who really would do a lot of the ETL activities. So they would work a lot on the data, preparing it, making sure that it's right, making sure that it's organized well. They work very closely within other teams with business to ensure you know, that the data is in the best possible state uh, as well. Then the data scientists, so this, um, you know, this is a bit of a limited view, but you sort of have two kinds of data scientists. You have a data scientist who is customer facing, this is not somebody who is writing the machine learning models, but this is somebody who understands them very well and perhaps uh, has the same level of education, but is focused uh, you know, on, on assisting the customer to understand the value of AI, to derive value from AI and that kind of thing. And then you have a data scientist who's focused on the actual algorithms and building models and improving models and so forth. They are really innovating and trying to add value with data with data in the business. This is then somebody who would be writing a lot of code in R, um, you know, as well as in Python, in order for them to, to achieve their particular, their particular purpose. Sorry, then you also have then the leadership type roles. In that leadership capacity, obviously they're not really writing the models, they're not cleaning the data, uh, but they're actually consumers of all of that and they have to make strategic decisions based on the input that they're actually you know, getting. And then often that becomes the path, right? That you could, you could go from being a data scientist to being in some sort of leader, manager position or a data analyst, leader, manager position and so forth. There's also obviously the architecture type roles that are involved in this, but I'm not gonna you know, really mention them as they don't use uh, the same sort of set of tools that I really liked uh, you know, uh, from data camp in terms of explaining how this flow could actually, uh, could actually look like, okay? So, so that gives you that particular sense. And maybe you are then asking say, what could be some of the next things that you could do if you are interested in, uh, you know, in, machine, in machine learning? What, what you could do, I would say one, learn to code, right? learn to code in Python or in R. If you are going to be working in time series data, I work in time series data, I think R is better. Uh, there's a lot of statistical uh, tools that are readily available. Uh, Python is not uh, you know, as mature in that particular area. Uh, but then again, if you're gonna work on deep uh, you know, neural networks, Python, is much better, uh, you know, e e because it works well with uh, the the deep learning framework that already exists for it, such as your Keras uh, and your 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 TensorFlow uh, and as well as your PyTorch uh, side of things, your MXNet and so forth. So you know, it really depends on what you want to do. But as the start, I would say just learn to code, right? Uh, get back into it and then brush up on a little bit of mathematics. This is not critical, but it becomes important in the learning journey in order for you to understand what the algorithms are doing. Otherwise, you will just parrot learn some techniques here and there, uh, but that's not really sustainable uh, long-term if you want to build anything valuable. Uh, and the math that I'm talking about here is that if you're able to understand the math that I showed you, you're actually already there. Um, the only thing I would say you must add is understanding how, how uh, you know, a little bit of linear algebra uh, specifically from uh, matrix notation. So how do you add two matrices together? How do you multiply them, uh, you know, and, and so forth? Um, you know, that, those become some of the, the critical things. Uh, how do you invert a matrix? How do you calculate a determinant? And this helps, understanding this helps because sometimes you'll be writing code there into an existing package, but it will give you an error, uh, like, uh, you know, the, the data that you've given is not uh, positive definite. Um, if you don't actually understand the match, you, have, you will have no idea what that means and you'll have no idea then how to debug, uh, you know, and actually fix, uh, you know, your, your particular uh, system. 
And then the other thing I think you should do with immediate effect is to take on Andrew Inks course on machine learning on Coursera. I think there are videos of it available on YouTube, but it's a fascinating, fascinating course. I took this a few years ago. Uh, it was still in, in, um, in MATLAB, but I was using Octave and it was so good. You know, it was so, so good. And since then I've kept up with the stuff that he does on deep learning that AI He's a very good, uh, you know, educator. So that's worth worthwhile. And then fourthly, follow influential people uh, in the AI world. So Andrew Ng being one of those, Sebastian Chen, you know, the, the American guys uh, are doing quite a lot, uh, but there are also South African guys that are, that are here doing interesting work that you can go and say for the, you know, CAIR, uh, Center for Artificial Intelligence Research, and then just look at the guys who are working in that. And those could be good guys to actually follow in terms of from a, from a local point of view. Um, you know, there are people like Chilizi Marwara, if you know, who have written a lot as well, they are worth following as well. Uh, in fact, a good strategy is just go to Chilizi Marwara uh, and look at everyone he's supervised and just follow all those guys. Those are tend to be the most influential people in South African AI right now. And then fifthly, take on a machine learning project, right? So just replicate an existing one, go to Kegel or the one that I showed you, that was just a replication from, uh, you know, from, from Deep Note. Just take it and say, this is an example and then replicate it with your own data and do it yourself and then keep improving, keep doing more and then you will move into more advanced stuff and then follow Kegel and similar. So Kegel, uh, you know, it's a machine learning community but there are competitions as well. So those competitions can teach you how, uh, you know, sort of this machine learning guys think and how they are, go about solving problems and so forth. And then I've just shown you three books um, that I think could be helpful in sort of different domains. The first one is just, if you're interested in the deep learning stuff and you're interested in the maths as well, uh, this is quite a, you know, a, a, a good book to, 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 to get into. And it's specifically, I think it's built on MXNet and PyTorch. So you're gonna be working in, in Python as well as a, a library as well. And then this, um, you know, um, machine learning master, mastery, this guy has a blog, which I like a lot. He has a lot of code examples. So I would recommend you to follow him. Even if you don't get the, the book, just follow him. And then uh, lastly, uh, Python, this, this last book is, uh, it's not uh, the best written book, but in terms of clarity and simplicity, it's one of the easiest. Uh, and it really takes you from basic understanding of Excel all the way to, to Python, uh, you know, AI. It's, it's a long book, um, yeah, but it's very easy to actually follow, uh, you know, as well. And then just my last slide is a little bit of a bonus, you know, you know to, for those that are saying I'm interested, but the code stuff, uh, you know, is not really for me. There is the K9, which I just showed you now. This uh, really works uh, on building machine learning workflows and then you are able to, to, to still achieve the same, the same outcomes. And if you can code as well, you can still work with them because you can a Python script, um, you know, a, a, as well. There's also Orange. So Orange comes with a platform called Anaconda. So if you want to use uh, Python, I would recommend for you to download Anaconda and use it, uh, you know, through, through Anaconda as your, as your package manager and so forth. And then the last one is Weka. Weka is very popular in uh, academic circles. Um, you know, so you can play around with it. Um, but I'll say Orange is a free one that's available. K9, there is a free version, uh, which is quite useful and usable as well um, for those that don't actually want to, to write any, any code. Um, yeah, I think I've said a lot uh, and I have used all the, you know, all the time. So let me pause here and see if there are any questions and if there are specific things that you guys want me to touch on a little bit more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's hear from the guys if you have any question. I think this is our time to try to try to clarify some of the things. Well, yes, yeah. I think you, you, you have said the mouthful. Yes, me, John. Okay, no, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, uh, Rizani. Thank you very much. So I just wanted to check you know, uh, with regards to the historical data. So I liked the example that, you know, you were showing us. So, but my interest in is uh, in how much data one requires, you know, to actually come up with the, you know, accurate model, you know, how much, 
or how far back should one go in terms of the historical data? So that's actually um, a question. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the, there isn't a clear cut answer, uh, but the general rule is that uh, you know the more data you have, the better. So that's a general rule. It's not always a right rule based on what you want to do. So in time series data, for example, going too far back can actually uh, diminish your, your model uh, because the, you know, the, the, of the, there's something called non-stationarity, which I don't wanna really get into too much, but the, the idea is that the, because the, that your data is not constant, you know, it's, all, it's ever evolving in time series, which is why it makes it very difficult to forecast the stock price. So even if you had stock prices for the past hundred years, let's say even a thousand years, if it were possible, you wouldn't be any wiser than a person who has stock prices for the last five years. In fact, the last five years might just be the most meaningful years in order to predict uh, the next year. Uh, so it depends on the domain that you're looking at. But in general, if you're using uh, deep learning models, the more the better. A time series model, which is sort of where I, I work, uh, you know, a, a, a simple model such as uh, one of the traditional models can, can work with that little as uh, 50 data points, uh, which is not a lot at all. But if you want to then move to machine learning techniques, you want to, I would say double, double those data points. And yeah, double those data points, um, or if not triple, even fourple, the more the merrier. It will, it will make your, your model better. Uh, just don't go too far back based on the, the context of that time series uh, data. If it's images, images are obviously static, so the world is different there. So you need, you can, the more the better. So if you can get a million, get a million. If you can get 10 million, even better. A hundred million, even better, and so forth and so forth. So a lot of these models that are doing very well now um, are doing well because they have more data. They also are bigger as well in the deep learning world. Um, so that two combination is very important for performance in the, in the deep learning context. I hope that was clear. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Any any other question, the clarity, or even the comment? Yeah. Um, can I have just a one question? So, so in terms of like uh, the risks, like uh, in terms of deploying um, the models into a system that is uh, integrated with multiple systems across the network, what can be those uh, the risk and what are the challenges in terms of that? Well, it, it, it always depends, right? Uh, in terms of what that system actually actually does. Remember what you are doing with, uh, you know, with, uh, with AI is that your output is not a system. So your output is a model. This model, you would then integrate into a system. So that system, for example, if you want to improve your KYC in a bank uh, setup, you know, know your customer, you could use uh, you know, a lot of uh, machine learning techniques and then you would integrate those into your existing system and it would have to comply with your, with your existing governance, uh, uh, governance rules that you actually have in place. But in itself, it's a model. So there isn't really um, a system that you are integrating you are putting a model in. Um, typically what you would do if you are building it on Asia, for example, you would then create a web service uh, um, and then you would consume it on your system as a web service. Um, and, and essentially you, you, you could then have that, this web service allowing you to input particular data and then that web service would then uh, shoot out the answer, you know, risky, not risky and so forth. Um, but there are, uh, you know, risks if, um, you know, there is, uh, you know, sort of malicious, uh, malicious things that were that were done to your to your model. Um, you know, obviously so the, that that can actually happen as well. So these models can be fooled, and they can be fooled by very silly things. So you can add some noise, um, you know, to what the model is seeing, and that model will give you the wrong output. <clears throat> but that model uh, is not the problem. Uh, you know, it, it's really some of the the biases in it. Um, yeah. So so. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I'm answering your question very, very well. Uh, but it's because it's not a system that you get out. You get a model that yeah. you put into a system. 
Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So obviously, like these models can also be used for, um, you know, uh, security kind of, um, you know, controls. Um, to say, um, let's detect like, um, you know, threats or whatever uh, within our um, organization yeah. or something like that, right? Okay. Yeah. So, so one case study that I didn't mention is anomaly detection. So if you if you deploy it, uh, you know, in a in a context where, for example, you want to detect uh, sort of threats and so forth, you would use uh, anomaly detection uh, type algorithms. This is where these algorithms are able to pick out, um, lack of better words, outlier activities, and automatically flag that, um, you know, as a a a fraudulent activity that you need to pick up. Banks already use this to a certain extent, where if you you all of a sudden you you only do your banking in Gauteng and then all of a sudden your card is being used somewhere in Sanin the bank would automatically block that as an anomaly because you don't normally do anything in Gauteng so this AI systems can cover can cover anomaly in the way that you spend in the location that you spend whom you send money to how frequent and so forth so they can cover a lot of cases and they can also cover cases that are not obvious as well mm. So in terms of um, like the industries, even like, for network, uh, by the way, in networking, uh, you know, there there is a lot of anomaly detection that you do there as well. Oh, okay. So I'm talking about like if, in terms of uh, in telecommunication, normally there's uh, too much fraud in terms of like your SIM boxing and you know um, SIM shopping or whatever. So can that also be used uh, for that as well? Um, I, I lost you a little bit. Uh, I, I just heard the, the end. Can you please repeat, Walter? Okay. So I'm saying in terms of in a telecommunication space, right? So that's where a lot of frauds like SIM boxing and, you know, SIM swapping frauds are happening. So um, is that maybe one of the use cases that can be used there as well? Yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of, I think the, the use cases of AI are, uh, to summarize all of them is to say where a decision is made using data, that decision can be improved by AI. So if there is data that informs a decision, you can use AI definitely. Um, so you can you can do uh, a lot even uh, you know in the context of uh, you know of the uh, the sim sim related type frauds. Yeah, that definitely you can. Uh, cool. Thanks, man. Great. Thank you. Any other comment, question? Yeah, Mr. Mutogwe. Yes, Mahadi. Yes, uh, firstly, I just want to thank you and uh, Mr. Zan Mlauzi for the great uh, session. Uh, I think some of us learned a lot. So I just wanted to check. I see, uh, Ruzan, you've mentioned that uh, the, the programming languages one should look at is Python and R. And I just wanted to see, I mean, languages like Java, C Sharp and so on, are, is there any movement in that space of uh, AI or uh, deep learning? I mean, is there anything going on there uh, that someone could, could, could leverage uh, on? Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so the, the, the answer is yes and no. Um, so what you want to do when you pick a, a language is that you, you, you want to pick a language and a framework you, where there's a, an existing community and lots of support as well. So Python um, has the, it was built for, for numerical compute. Well, not really, but it added a lot of numerical computation capabilities quickly through the implementation of something called NumPy. So other languages stuck to, you know, we're going to build, uh, focus on the best MVC system, you know, the best object orientated uh, programming environment. Whereas Python moved in that uh, sort of direction. R is made specifically for statistical programming. So it's born out of, uh, out of the space, similarly with MATLAB, but MATLAB obviously has licensed in cost and it's mostly used in academia and engineering. Um, so those languages are the top languages when it comes to, to, to artificial uh, intelligence, machine learning type things. Um, there is, uh, you know, small fragments of, uh, you know, of JavaScript 
JavaScript. You, so you can do something with JavaScript. You can do something with uh, with C plus uh, plus. You know, but you know, I, I would I would recommend uh, that you do languages where there's a big support uh, support communities. Um, I don't think there's a you know there's really a lot of movement in the C sharp world, uh, but fortunately C sharp is complex enough so that it's very easy for you to move into into Python without uh, breaking much of a much of a sweat. Um, and then from a deployment point of view, that's where JavaScript, uh, you know, is the language of the web. So so that remains sort of a, a necessary language. But yeah, so there isn't a lot of as much movement. And then the other thing as well is that current, um, you know, uh, machine learning is very much uh, deep learning to a large extent. Uh, and uh, and all the deep learning frameworks, um, you know, most of them, um, you know, you can you can almost say uh, um, uh, like I think something like between PyTorch and TensorFlow, um, you know, they they probably have around seventy percent market share. The rest would be the small other frameworks that are sort of all over all over the place. Uh, TensorFlow is is Python. PyTorch is Python. Um, so you know. Yeah, do go for Python and R. Thank you very much. Great, I think friends, uh, let's see, anyone else? Yeah, uh, maybe the last uh, question that I have for Rizani. But, but, but let's see, let me just thank Thank you, Rizani. I think it is one of the sessions that I really learned a lot. And I thought I know much about a, a machine learning, but uh, so your session has proved that, you know what, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know at all. But I had to actually talk him more. Uh, if, if you are listening carefully, I had more of the advantages of this machine learning, AI, deep learning, and the stuff. So I'm just wondering if there are some disadvantages any other Yeah, yeah, no, uh, definitely, you know, uh, John, there is a lot of uh, disadvantages. Um, you know, the for, for, for one disadvantage, so a lot of the disadvantages that we have in AI is that we turn into research projects. So one disadvantage of it is the, you know, the bias issue that I spoke about when I was talking about ethics. So I, I called it ethics, but it's also referred to as bias. So that's where is that it's a garbage in garbage out system. So if you train your system only on a particular type of people, you will inherit uh, bias. So if our system right now as the world stands are biased against women, uh, then the system will also be biased against women because that's the data that we have. If our system are biased against black people, then the system will be biased. So we've seen this happening in the judicial system where black people's AI systems will, will just not give black people paroles at the, at the same rate as white people because you know black people are more dangerous or whatever the case is. But this is the bias that is already in the justice uh, system. And also these systems also make uh, very stupid mistakes. Um, so if, for, for, for example, you, 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 you build a system to recognize objects in an image, so it might make very silly mistakes uh, that don't make any sense at all, that when you look at, you just don't understand why it made that mistake, which is then part of the disadvantage. You don't know why it made that mistake. Uh, you know, so, so it's really one of those where it takes a lot of uh, understanding a lot of work just to try and figure out why it made the mistake, but they still make very, very stupid mistakes, mistakes that humans would not make. Um, you know, so, so there is a lot of, uh, you know, disadvantage. Uh, like, uh, you know, as, as we said earlier, I think with uh, Walter, in terms of uh, the more the data you have, the better, especially in the language processing, the image processing. In other words, where the type of data you have is, is, is stationary. It, it's, it's, it's fairly constant over, over time. You need a lot of data to get better results. But then part of the disadvantage is that if you want to translate between, you know, CPAD, you know, and Chivenda, it becomes an impossible task because in both cases, you have very limited digital data to actually accomplish that particular task. So it becomes very difficult. Um, yeah, so, so the disadvantages are many. Uh, and I guess the last one, which is important as well, is that the, 
the, there's something that I didn't talk about, but it's called hyperparameters. So the difference between a parameter and a hyperparameter is that the hyperparameter determines the speed at which the parameter changes, okay? So often when you are building a system, uh, a machine learning system, what you have control over tends to be the hyperparameters. And when you are saying, you are, I am improving my system, I've changed this and that, often you are saying, I have played around with my hyperparameters so that uh, you know my system actually behaves better. The process of finding a hyperparameter right now, it's fairly static, it's, it's fairly, you know, it's not sophisticated. So there are techniques such as um, auto ML that are trying, that are researching ways to actually address this. Uh, so, so it becomes, it's, it's very unsophisticated, we, which all, almost always begs the question that, you know, could you actually have found better hyperparameters? So it's almost like this infinite, uh, you know, sort of search. Um, yeah, and also the systems are expensive to run. As I said, GPT-3 cost, uh, you know, it's estimated to be $10 million. So that's 300 million rands just to train a neural network, uh, you know, uh, as big as GPT-3. Uh, you know, so, so the disadvantages are many, but uh, all the disadvantages are actually research projects as we actually speak. So there is a lot of uh, research opportunities uh, in this space. Um, you know, so I focus on on uh, non-stationary data and and how to actually focus non-stationary data, and that's part of the disadvantage of this uh, techniques. Uh, they they can't deal well with non-stationary data. So then that becomes a, a a research question for someone to pursue. Um, yeah, so so it's quite a it's quite a bit. And the last one, sorry, just uh, this one, this two, this one is important. Is just the explainability. So once a deep learning model tells you, don't give this person a loan, they, they, you know, they're a bad payer. You ask it why, you actually don't know. There's no answer. You know, it becomes uh, guesswork uh, between you and, and the rest of the people around the table. And you might come up with a hypothesis that uh, the model then says to give this one a loan and it doesn't really fit the hypothesis that you come up with. Um, so there's a lot of work in explainable AI to improve um, some, of, some of this stuff. This is what we use at Bridge. So we use explainable AI uh, techniques to not only tell you what the, the AI has spat out, but we tell you the reason it actually has made that particular uh, recommendation. So yeah, so there's a lot of work. AI is super exciting, lots of exciting work that's happening. Uh, the time couldn't be better uh, to actually join the boat and, and uh, learn a bit and, and play around with it, just because it's never been easier before. You, you don't need to know as much maths as you would have ordinarily needed uh, because some of these frameworks cover, cover, cover it as well. Um, so it's quite exciting. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think we can talk, with, <laughs> this is a very interesting topic here yeah, to, to, to us all. And I think we can talk for the whole, the whole uh, you know, uh, afternoon. I'd like to say thank you very much for Rosanna to making your time and during Sunday like this, uh, like most of us we were having commitments, but you decided to be with us here. Thank you very much for clearly, you know, uh, and simply explaining this, what is deep learning, uh, machine learning and, and artificial intelligence. I'm um, overview that we really have a gist of what those things are. And of course you elaborated in terms of what do we need to do if we want to take this thing forward. So thank you. Thank you very much for, for your time. And we really appreciate, appreciate it. And we're looking forward to, to collaborate with you in future. You talked about the, your, the company, the, the work that you do through your company. And we're looking forward to really uh, learn more and collaborate with you. So thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if you have a last, last wait for, last wait for us. And we will then close the, the session. Yeah. yeah, just a last one from me, Mutokwe. Uh, thanks so much for, for, her, for, for having me. Uh, this was really a pleasure um, and I really enjoyed it as well. So thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it, it was really a great way to spend, uh, you know, the Sunday, the Sunday afternoon. So I'm very grateful uh, to have been with you guys today. Right, thank you. To the colleagues, we will, this session is recorded. We will also upload it on our channel, YouTube. I'll send the email with the link so that we can just go and recap. There are lots of things that we mentioned today. Some most 90% to me were new, right? So I think it will be key for us to go back to the session and, and uh, you know, 
listen to it. And I, as Ruzani, uh, we can still send me the question if you have for him, then I can forward to him and then he will, in the meantime, uh, answer some of the questions. So thank you very much, friends, making time. And I know today was a derby, but you colleagues and friends, you decided to be with us. Thank you, thank you very much. Walter, you will close the, the, the recording and then you should save it there for your site and we will talk off uh, outside of this session. No, apparently now you are the host. Yep. So if, okay, great. No, then that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next of next, next week, actually, we'll be talking project management, right? So please uh, uh, join us there. We'll be talking everything project management. And as we mentioned, everything talk, uh, there's interrelatedness with, through all this session that we, we talk about cloud computing, we talk about it. We talk about um, business intelligence. We saw we talk about we're talking about data analysts, and then we talked about uh, databases. The data he talk, was talking about here. So now to saying how do you manage all of these things that we talked about? So join us next week on the 15th. I'll be featuring a friend Augustine from Tanzania, and then also Homozo Mokoto from South Africa. They are well vested and they are well. Uh, uh, the expert in the field of project and portfolio and program management. Thank you very much, friends. See you next week. Bye bye. Thank you, Jess.